you've enjoyed your lunches. Those of you in the overflow room, thank you for volunteering to do that. Um, my role here is very brief, it's basically just to introduce the next speakers. So I did want to just remind you to uh, be sure to fill in your conference survey so that we can see what your thoughts are on improvements for the next one. Also to announce that the reception and poster session will be in the same room starting at 6.30 this evening. So please be sure and come by and talk to the students who are doing the posters and enjoy the reception. So I have the privilege and pleasure of introducing my former boss, Ben Schlesinger, who is the past president and head of the awards committee. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with how the kind of leadership structure of the USAEE works, it's really a four-year commitment. You start out as a president-elect and you're in charge of the strategic plan so you can kind of set the guidelines for your presidential year. You then serve as the president and are basically the host of the North American Conference, and then in your third year, you're head of the nominating committee, and in the fourth year, which is Ben's position this year, you're head of the awards committee. So I'd like to introduce Ben, who will make the awards announcement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. It's such a delight to work with and to be such a wonderful deal as president. Um, I can say I'm proud, and I... The Edelman Frankel Award um, is given to an individual organization uh, for a unique and innovative contribution to the field of energy economics. That's off the website. Uh, actually, uh, there's more to say than that. The, the award is the most, this is the most prestigious honor that the U.S. Association for Energy Economics uh, can bestow. It's gone to some of the field's most uh, famous and most innovative energy economists. Uh, there were years uh, when it wasn't bestowed. But not this year. Uh, our awards committee was delighted to present, um, is delighted to present the Edelman Frank Award this year to the Center for Energy Studies at the James uh, A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. Uh, in particular, the center has been producing some of the most authoritative and uh, creative analyses of natural gas policy and economic issues anywhere. Uh, their work and insights have been utterly invaluable to all energy advisors and teachers in our field. Uh, this award to them, in uh, our view, is overdue. Accepting this year's um, Edelman Frankel Award um, on behalf of uh, the Institute uh, will be Dr. Kenneth B. Medlock, Senior Director of the Institute's Center for Energy Studies. Ken, congratulations. So I guess as is customary, I, I've been asked to say a few words. It's, uh, it's difficult to actually think of anything appropriate to say, to be honest with you, when um, I'm accepting an award on behalf of a lot of people, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak. Um, because the Center for Energy Studies at the Baker Institute was an expansion of an initiative that started about 17 years ago. Um, uh, really uh, geared towards, I'm trying to understand how various issues can affect uh, policy and how policy can affect markets. Um, the, uh, uh, the inception of what was previously called the Energy Forum was really geared to be a membership group um, to designed to facilitate interaction between academics and industry. Uh, it's been remarkably successful. It's actually still uh, a fundamental feature of the Center for Energy Studies. Um, and so when you try to say thanks for all the work that, that you know, has led to this award. It really is, it's everybody. It, it, it's, it's all the individuals at Rice that I've been so fortunate to work with. Uh, Amy Jaffe, prior to her moving to the University of California, Davis. Peter Hartley uh, has been a colleague uh, for many years, uh, dating back to my time as a graduate student at Rice, actually working as a research associate with the energy program. So, um, uh, and, and the list goes on and on. Um, We've been able to learn tremendous amounts of information to inform uh, our data-driven, and that's really one of the critical things that sets us apart, I think, from a lot of other institutions that look at policy issues, is we do ground ourselves in economic analysis. And it's, uh, it's grounded in trying to understand all of the pieces that go into uh, uh, forming commercial decisions. Uh, this means diving all the way underground, thinking about Lately, for example, work we've been doing uh, in a collaborative way with the University of Texas Bureau of Economic Geology, um, how to characterize shale resources 
and ultimately what that means for understanding what break-even costs are to be blunt. So um, all of these things sort of go into the hopper, if you will, uh, and allow us to, to generate a tremendous amount of information. Collaborations have always been something that we've been very keen on. We're at Rice, a relatively small institution, uh, so we actually do benefit tremendously from engaging with uh, other partners, both in industry and in academia. A uh, long history of working with people at Stanford, at Harvard, um, uh, most recently at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so just sort of we can go down a list, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but you know, it's, it's, it's been really uh, fortunate for us to be able to draw on all this expertise and be able to do the things we do. Um, we've, over the last few years, been able to really develop some, some pretty sophisticated models that allow us to stress um, what would otherwise be considered commercial outcomes uh, via different kinds of policy interventions. And this is one of the ways we can effectively quantify externalities associated with policy. And this is a big focus of the work we do, and it will continue to be a big focus of the work we do. Over the next two to five years, we'll be doing um, a tremendous amount of work actually looking at shale, uh, as we have been over the last two to five years. Um, uh, but in particular, uh, we'll be looking at how various state policies and federal policy overlays of, uh, in that regard will influence shale gas developments and shale oil developments. And then taking it a step further beyond just understanding what's going to happen to the upstream and midstream levels, but actually moving downstream to understand a little bit more about what the you know, tremendous resource opportunity that we have in North America means for uh, all of the various interested parties. Um, so it's not just about LNG experts. Uh, it's also about industrial opportunities in the pet chem sector and other gas intensive sectors as well as power generation and then of course that facilitates uh, uh, discussions about lowering carbon intensities and other sort of environmental benefits that, that, that follow therein. So um, keep a look out because all this stuff is coming um, and uh, uh, we will uh, we'll be rolling out things as we always have been in a very consistent manner uh, understanding that um, you know I have a saying I'm back up when you're in the policy space, you always worry about being too right-leaning or too left-leaning. I know that we've done something right when we get criticized from both sides of the aisle. So, um, you know, it's, it's usually the way we try to sort of, you know, hit right back up the middle. Um, because quite frankly, the data is going to tell the story and you, you can't really manipulate it. Uh, and if you try to, it's going to come out. So, um, with that, I'll go ahead and step down. Uh, but I want to say thank you again. And, uh, it's been a great pleasure to interact with all of you because certainly everything that's happened at the Baker Institute has benefited tremendously from the interaction with USAE and um, you can see that we at Rice take it very seriously quite frankly because uh, we actually have uh, two existing graduate students here and two who recently just graduated um, and, and we'll continue to promote that you know very uh, profitable engagement. Um, because our graduate students get a lot from being able to interact uh, via the conference venues and presentations, getting feedback and then networking, quite frankly, because a lot of you guys are great potential employment opportunities. So um, <laughs> I can't let that go without being said. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and stop. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Ken, and congratulations. I realized that I failed to do the one thing I was supposed to, which was to introduce the head table. You've already met Ken, Med Ken Medlock and Ben Schlesinger, Lori Schell, Roger, we met Roger Marks earlier today, Jack Roderick, who will be our speaker, and Matt Berman um, from the University of Alaska. I think it's purely coincidence that the insiders are all over here and the outsiders are all over here. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Roger. For those of you who are interested in low probability events, uh, the discovery of a 25 billion barrel field in 1967 on the north slope of Alaska is a good story. And the, de the definitive uh, telling of that story was made in the book Crude Dreams that was uh, published in 1997, as well as all the events that led up to the discovery. And we're uh, very fortunate to have the author of that book here today, Jack Roderick. Uh, Jack came up to Alaska in the 50s where he started an oil reporting service and since then he has had his own exploration company. He's been a lawyer, he was the mayor of Anchorage, he was the deputy commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, he was the state energy director, and he's been an adjunct professor uh, at the University of Alaska. 
And although uh, he and I have probably disagreed on every oil and gas policy issue over the past 20 years, <laughs> it is really my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Ted Roger. <laughs> said that most of you are economists. <laughs> I know nothing about economy. I'm a politician, or I was, let's put it that way. But my job here today is tell you some of the history of Alaska and how we became an oil state. And uh, as Roger mentioned, I came up here from San Francisco by way of Seattle 60 years ago, worked in a cannery became a truck driver, and when my employer went bankrupt, I started this oil reporting service. So what I know about oil, I learned sort of from the, the outside. Um, let me give, let me see if I work this right. Yep. I show you this picture only to show you the complexity, land ownership complexity, and also the offshore. These are the sedimentary basins, and just about every sedimentary basin in Alaska has been drilled. So there was a lot of exploration going on in the early days. I should say, too, that uh, seepages all over the world have been the first indicator of oil, of course. And even back in the 1830s, uh, the Canadians knew that there was a oil seepage up on the Arctic slope. And as the Russians decided to sell their land to, uh, to us, the U.S., they knew there were seeps on the Gulf of Alaska, down south of it, on both on the west side at a place called Kanatic, and on the east side at Catala. You see Catala over on the right, uh, kinetic on the left, and the star is where we are now. So now you're down on the Gulf of Alaska. There's a seep at Catala, and in 1901, believe it or not, a British consortium came here and drilled at Catala, at that seep. And uh, their first well, they drilled to uh, 69 feet. I'm sorry, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> well, they drilled a shallow well and they produced 50 barrels a day. And then they drilled some more wells. That's the so-called first discovery. And here's, the, the, the Brits sold out to a group from Seattle, and they then built a refinery, and for 32 years they produced uh, diesel that went into the railroad that ran from Cordova up to Kennecott. In 32 years they produced 154,000 barrels. That's about, what, a fourth of a day from Prudhoe. And then, by chance, when the uh, copper mine shut down, the refinery burned. So that was the, yes, the end of that. Now, over, uh, let's jump to 1920. Over on the west side of the Gulf of Alaska, uh, there were seeps at a village called Kinetic. And in, uh, prior to 1920, you know, you had to stake for oil just like you do other minerals. But Congress passed the Mineral Leasing Act in 1920. That got the attention of Chevron. In those days, it was uh, uh, Standard of California. They came up in 1923 and drilled several wells, again at the seeps. Again, no major production. 
Uh, the same year, 1923, Congress set aside the west half of the Arctic Slope into what was called Petroleum Reserve Number Three, uh, Four. Number Three was at uh, Teapot Dome down in California. And now, of course, the west half is called the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska. Let's fast forward a little bit now, in 1950. The guy in the hat on the right is a man named Bill Ferran. He's up there in 1923. Well, we're back now in uh, the Petroleum Reserve Number 4. He spent two summers up there with that gang trying to figure out, is there any oil in the National in the Petroleum Reserve? Uh, he uh, found a lot of coal, but he didn't find anything that really looked much like the gas. But now we're down <clears throat> at a place called Icy Bay on the east shore of the Gulf of Alaska, where Phillips drilled two dry holes between 54 and 57. And the man on the right is Phil O'Rourke. In those days, he was the only employee of a major oil company living in Alaska. Oh, was a geologist. And after the dry hole, they decided, well, Phillips is going to pull out. And they started to, but a company from Los Angeles, a relatively small major oil company, Richfield Oil Corporation, in the Moose Range in 1957 brought in Alaska's first commercial well, at Swanson River, more than a half billion barrels. It's on the Kenai Moose Range, as I said. As a result of that, there were about 20, we're still not on federal land, remember, about 25 million acres were uh, leased all over Alaska, except, of course, on the North Slope, because it wasn't available. Uh, Chevron brought half of Richfield's action on the Kenai, took over the management of the Swanson River field, and uh, then in 63, Richfield made a deal with Exxon because Richfield had moved up to the uh, Arctic Slope and uh, on federal land, and they made a deal with Exxon, and Exxon paid them $3 million to take half interest in what they were going to find up on the Arctic Slope. That was some deal. Huh? Um, there's the July of 57. And then a year later, only a year later, Congress awarded us data. Uh, Ike signed the bill on January 3rd, 59. We had a population of about 200,000 at that time. And the politics was get rid of outside interests, fish traps, ownership in Seattle. We were a place that felt very strongly about controlling our future. And we could finally vote for our governor. Up to that time, the president appointed our governor. State was, under state, the state was given 25, 25 years to elect 104 million acres, titled all offshore land out to three miles, as had other states. Very little private land in Alaska, still is, till the natives show up short, shortly. Well, the, the, the uh, state needed money to set itself up. So it started offering offshore land in Cook Inlet on a bonus bid basis. All our leases are given on a cash basis, fixed royalty. 
with a few little exceptions if we, if we want to do that. Um, at the time, the state had a 1% severance tax. The prime movers in Cook Inlet at that time were Chevron, Union, Shell, Marathon, Pan American, but a whole raft of other companies, Sinclair, Skelly, Atlantic, Gulf, British American, Husky, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were active, looking for oil. Um, and in the 60s, the mid-60s, uh, lots of discoveries in the inlet and platforms were installed. I think we had 14 at one point, maybe we still do. Um, and there are the fields that are generally in, uh, in Cook Inlet. And of course, as you know, that we finally have two offshore rigs operating in Cook Inlet uh, that we haven't had for three decades. I'm not a geologist, but I, I think that Cook Inlet is a gas province. We're going to find a lot of gas, if any legislators are listening, because we don't really need, I don't think, to bring the gas from the Cook Inlet down here. I don't think. Two months before our famous 1964 earthquake, Billy and our governor decided, okay, I'll select some land on the North Slope for the state. He selected a, a million three acres on the coastal plain between Anwar and the Petroleum Reserve. Why these acres? Uh, you'll have to read my book. <laughs> I have a theory and I think it's right. Um, so that's the selection up there on the coast. And then, of course, the earthquake in March of 64. Uh, we needed the money again, of course. Uh, so we put up, the state put up uh, leases up on the slope. Um, cash bonus, fixed royalty again. The sales, the first was in 1964, December, after the earthquake. And most of it was turned out to be caparic, and it was, most of it gotten by a single.